Here's your host, who believes defeat is not an option, spits magic and poetry from his fingertips, has just one speed go, and he acts like this even without drugs, Paul Asadorian! I think that was the best introduction yet, Larry. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you're going to put my brain on for one minute, and you're going to be like, unplug this thing! <laughs> Paul just likes it because that's the first one in five weeks where he said something like supportive and constructive and nice about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, man. It didn't make fun of me too, at all, really. But no. It, it was kind of ironically uh, interesting, though. Yes. Oh, boy. Oh, well, boy. welcome to this edition of Paul.com Security Weekly, episode 233, for Thursday, March 3rd, 2011. I like how Larry has control of the cameras this week, and he just puts it on him the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what? it's on you right now. Oh, it's on me right now. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. See, now it's going to go back to me because you're not important. <laughs> <laughs> but even Paul's better. Just read so, but, but, uh, so, Paul, it's even better. See, first you get this one. Yeah. And, and then you get this one. Uh -huh. Oh, see? two see? cameras on the set. <laughs> That's awesome. One. Uh, Two. Of course, Mr. Larry Pesci here <laughs> on the video, <laughs> the video boards, uh, and uh, here for this edition, Paul.com. Yeah, you know what? I'm on drugs. You are? Yeah, I'm what, on like Larry Pesci. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I Those watched are the, some uh, awesome, uh, awesome drugs. I, I, I watched the Charlie Sheen interviews today. I, I could not stop laughing, which is where the inspiration for the, the uh, lead-in for you to came from today. Very nice. Very yes. nice. I think. I don't know. Yes. And who else we got? We've got John Strand from South Dakota. What's up, John? How are the Black Hills? Actually, are the I'm Black not Hills? in South Dakota. I'm doing Paul.com with you guys with a beautiful sunset in Florida. Oh, very nice. Looking over the Magic Kingdom by any chance? You're retiring already? No, no, no. I'm actually just outside of Pensacola. Oh. I'm at Holbert Field. Very cool, very cool. Carlos Perez from, of course, Always Sunny, Puerto Rico. Hey, glad to be here and not be up there with you guys in the cold. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Supposed to go to what, single digits tonight? Oh, it's still cold. It's terrible. Mm. Terrible. Uh, uh, but speaking of, uh, speaking of not terrible, Wasted Strand will be presenting the wireless security edition of the security Fail monthly podcast, uh, webcast rather, Wednesday, March 9th, 2011 at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. There is a link to register in the show notes. Yeah. Well, we're rather ironic that John is doing the wireless one. Yes, it is kind of ironic. Don't choke. <laughs> <laughs> well, only, only because wireless is something that Larry and I really is like one of our first true loves. Mm -hmm. It's where Larry and I really fell in love for the maybe the second time. Is in Josh Wright's Securing Wireless yeah. class. It was yeah. one of the first editions of that class. Yeah, that's... Larry and I sat next to each other and held hands the whole time. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't that where we recorded the first podcast? And it is where we recorded the first Paul Lacombe podcast. Wow. It is, in fact, where the, much of the love oh. began, Larry, and still continues to this day. See, now I'm getting nervous. I feel like i got a lot to live up to. <laughs> that's the point, John. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, next yeah. week, um, which, is one of, which is probably the reason why John is presenting next Wednesday, because <laughs> next week, Larry and I and Darren will be at the Mid-Atlantic CCDC competition. That's the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Yeah. Badge hacking, penetration testing, Tons of presentations. Uh, the event will be streamed live on our Ustream channel. Nice. That's if everything goes as planned right, and, and everyone cooperates. And we don't wear black. And we don't wear black. <laughs> you'll be able to see us. <laughs> if not, you'll just see like a talking head. Um, yes. So the podcast uh, will also be streamed live, same time, same bat channel, on Thursday 7 to 9, next week, March 10th. Uh, and again, you can tune into the Paul.com live stream uh, next week on, uh, probably won't start till Friday, and so probably just Friday and Saturday. So Thursday night, Friday and Saturday. Right, right. So, yeah, so Thursday, the event doesn't start until 1 o'clock, and it's a yeah. lot of... It's a lot of administrivia, yep. so to Front. speak. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Source Boston, April 20th through the 22nd. Yeah. Paul and Larry will be there hanging out, talking security and drinking beer. Yep. I just saw the schedule. It looks like we're speaking on separate days. So oh. I will, uh, since we get to go to the conference as speakers anyway, we'll, yep. we'll go hang out. We'll have fun. I'm wondering if I should book a hotel room for that night in between I think, those two days. You know, I, I, think, I think we should share a room. What? I mean. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Just my way of getting you into bed, Larry. Oh, you want to put what where for how many animal crackers? <laughs> 
Alrighty, oh, while well, everyone counts their animal crackers, we will take a short break and come back with the feature technical segment for this show. We are pleased to welcome Sharon Kanhidi, the director at First Defense Information Security in the UK, where she specializes in social engineering. She has socially engineered her way into dozens of organizations across the UK and abroad, including company offices, sports stadiums, government facilities, and more. She is also a three-time winner of the Nobel Prize and enjoys belly dancing and space travel. Did she win the Nobel Prize for belly dancing? Uh, it could be. Sharon, welcome. Hi, guys. How's it going? It's going very well. It's going very well. I was joking on Twitter uh, with everyone. I said, we're going to have a lady on the show. And someone commented and said, well, does that mean she's going to use a GUI? Because the joke is girls use it. And I said, no, no, no. Uh -huh. I said a lady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, Paul, you're on the show every week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a little girl. It's different. Oh, it's different. Right, right. Yes. Okay. So, Sharon, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm excited to talk about social engineering, as always. Um, we first met at uh, BrewCon. That's right, yeah. I think uh, the first time you saw me, I was giving a uh, PowerPoint karaoke <laughs> in a awesome. very much drunken stupor talking about threesomes, which is... Uh, That's right. You know, I couldn't remember exactly what it was about, but I remember <laughs> it was pretty rude. Yes, yes. Mm. And you still agreed to come on the show, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're regretting it now, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it wasn't so much what you said or what the slide said. It was the actions that you did <laughs> with the file that was stuck in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> if only that was captured on camera. Wait, it yes. was. I believe, right that, I believe that move was called the janitor, Larry. I'll show it to you after the show. Please? <laughs> oh, what? Oh, gosh. So, Sharon, what's next on the social engineering agenda? You know, we've talked about social engineering a lot on the show. Um, and you've got some information about some of the... Uh, you know, same tricks that work, but uh, it's kind of the next evolution of social engineering. Yeah, sure. Well, what I think is really interesting is looking back into the history of the con artist and the scam artist mm -hmm. and seeing the kind of tricks that they've used in the past and then seeing them crop up again and again throughout history. And I'm talking way back. And it's the exact same tricks we see now mm -hmm. done by fishers and done by social engineers across the world. It's really interesting. Yeah, so I guess one of the things I wanted to cover was um, since social engineering is always so successful, how do we defend against it? Well, that's a really good question. And I think one of the best ways of defending against it is... Um, unfortunately, by being stung. So if you run social engineering tests, for example, people become a lot more aware. Yeah. Or if people have been conned in the past, they're an awful lot more aware of it. So I think, right, unfortunately, right, right. that's one of the best ways. But, you know, always, it's a case of ongoing training and awareness, which people never seem to get quite right. right. In, I, if I see a woman with pink hair approaching my building, I, I, she doesn't gain access. That's, that's one of my rules. What? Yeah, yeah, right. You would open the door. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. I, I, would. Just... <laughs> I would. You can come right in, plug right into my network. Not a problem. <laughs> I, I've always found that uh, female social engineers have a certain percentage higher success rate. Yeah, well, this always comes up when people ask me about social engineering. Mm -hmm. So it depends what kind of social engineering you're talking about. Uh, if you're doing a remote attack, a phishing attack, it doesn't really matter right, if you're right, male right. or female. Right. Telephone, it probably helps a bit. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to physical uh, social engineering and trying to get access to buildings, which is my favorite type, uh, mm -hmm. it just means you have to use a different pretext. Mm -hmm. So if I go in as a telecoms engineer or if I'm trying to get access to a data center or a comms room, people think there's something wrong. Yeah, mm. yeah that's interesting. <laughs> Even though I know my way around pretty well, you right, know? Right, so right. I'm much more likely to go in as a, a cleaner or a secretary or a temp on the job. Mm -hmm. So it just means you have to use a different pretext. And I don't think we're at the stage where we're aware enough in society for, for our security awareness is good enough for it to matter if you're male or female, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, you were telling me uh, at BrewCon uh, about a time that you were extremely successful and they like made you an uh, office and set you up with like coffee and invited you to the, the company birthday party for someone that worked there and, and all that kind of stuff. Can you share, oh, yeah. can you share <laughs> information about that? I thought that was a great story. Oh, that was really good. I mean, I've I've sat in with people at team meetings uh, 
I, I did a social engineer and I ended up in a building sitting with a team of about six people and I saw an empty desk there. So I just sat down and next thing they started having a team meeting. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, they haven't confronted me, which people rarely do. I'll stay sitting here. So they just kept talking and eventually I thought, OK, um, I'll just borrow your network cable over there and plug into the network. Mm-hmm. So they're going through their team meeting and then one of the guys says, oh, I'm just trying to pull up this report, but I don't seem to have any network access at the moment. Oh, no. <laughs> then, excuse me, I think I've got your network cable. Here you go. <laughs> so he, he said, thanks very much. And they just continued the team meeting. And they I was never, there for an hour. <laughs> and they never asked you who you were or what you were doing? Not once. Not wow. once. Oh, that's pretty funny. See, the problem is that it's it's very interesting that you know, that you, know, you can get in a, as uh, a secretary or or something of the like. And and Paul, you probably will do pretty well getting in, uh, you know, as a computer tech. Me, I can see the computer the guy, en- depending on the organization. The entertainment's here, all right. Or the entertainment, <laughs> or the guy carrying the plunger to unclog the toilet. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point. You really have to go with what physically suits you. And play to people's prejudices nearly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so tell me about the pink wig. What was the pretexting behind that? Well, that was actually uh, a Blade Runner night. Oh, it was, so it was a secret cinema night. Do you uh, have secret cinema over there? No. What is secret cinema? Oh, it's really cool. So the organisers uh, pick a random venue in London, and they send you. Uh, they don't tell you what the film is going to be, mm-hmm. and they send you loads of hints beforehand. So there's a dress code, in which case it was uh, some kind of cyber or futuristic dress code that particular night. Mm -hmm. So each day coming up to the final event, you get told a different clue. Mm -hmm. And you eventually get there. There's loads of entertainment all in a Blade Runner theme it was that night. It was really great. That's awesome. Love that. (laughs) Yeah, it was wicked. So um, regarding the social engineering attacks, you said that there were some really Mm -hmm. old tricks which still apply today. What are are some of those older tricks? Uh, Well, it... I think advanced fee fraud is a really good example. I mean, that's the earliest example I could find of advanced fee fraud was in the 16th century, believe it or not, Mm -hmm. at the time of the Spanish Armada. And you'd get get people targeting aristocrats in Britain. And some guy, the con artist, would dress up as an aristocrat and he'd bring a Spanish lady, a beautiful Spanish lady in his arm, and he'd target another aristocrat because you often go after somebody who's similar to you because Mm -hmm. you expect to be able to scam them a little easier. And he'd say to the guy, this beautiful lady's father uh, is trapped in Spain. He's in prison in Spain. And uh, if you give me some money to help release him, when he, gets out of, when he gets out of prison in Spain, he's going to give you loads of money. And on top of that, you can marry this beautiful lady. Hmm. Mm, that sounds very familiar. Pardon sounds me, pretty pardon. familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does, pardon yeah. me, sir. I'm Barrister such and such from yeah, yeah. Nigeria. And uh, if you can give me $1,000, I have millions for you. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And then have you guys ever heard of a guy called Eugène Francois Vidoc? No, can't say that I have. <laughs> um, he set up the French police, I believe. This was back in, I think, the 1800s. And he started out as a criminal himself, like to uh, do, pull a few scams on people. And he went to prison. And when he was in prison, each of the new prisoners that came in, he asked them to provide a list of any aristocrats or rich people, noblemen that they knew. And they would write to the noblemen with some excuse to advance some money to them again. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, it just goes way back, and uh, he published his memoirs, and the memoirs have an interesting statistic that of a hundred letters this guy V Doc would send to the noblemen, twenty were always answered. Hmm. So even back then, twenty percent of attacks yeah, that, were successful. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's so awesome. How similar is that today? You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's probably a lot lower than twenty percent, but the the barrier to entry is a lot lower too. Well, this is it. Yeah, exactly. But so, these, these scams just go on and on. And now, you know, they're, they're on Facebook, they're on every social network and site, and there's different tricks to make them more successful. Right, right. Yeah, you had some of the, uh, did you have something in there about social networks? Yeah, social networking as an enabler for social engineering. We've certainly seen a lot of that. Are there certain, oh my God, yeah. Are there certain tricks to make it more successful on the social networks? Well, I really like social networks for the reconnaissance more than anything. So finding out 
information that's very personal to individuals that allows you to create uh, a more targeted attack that's going to be more likely to succeed. Mm, mm. So whether it's something as simple as finding out when the birthday is um, with a list of friends, so you can send a birthday card or an email with an attachment from a friend saying happy birthday. Right, right. Uh, or send in a birthday card from a friend with a free USB stick in it here. I put, to, I put together some photos of us oh, oh. <laughs> from throughout the years. Anything yes. like that to what's your favorite pizza? Yeah, yeah. I did a really great one with pizzas before. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, it was the uh, the, the person on Facebook had uh, uh, listed that their favorite pizza chain was this one and yeah. uh, posed as the, the manager of the pizza chain closest to her office and said, yeah. hey, thanks for being a valued customer. You've won a pizza party for your office. Well, who's going to say no to that? <laughs> yeah. You tell me what you want, and we'll get it to you. You just need to fill out this Word document. <laughs> and I tell you what, those uh, pizza delivery shirts are pretty damn cheap on eBay as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so is some of part of being successful, I've heard other social engineers uh, say that as well, that uh, finding the right outfits or uniforms is Oh, important. yeah, definitely. And those are readily available, from what I'm told. Yeah, I mean, going back to the whole history repeating itself, uh, Frank Abagnale, who's obviously one of the best social engineers, uh, used to pretend to be a pilot. And that happens over and over. You put that into uh, any news website and there's probably something from the last 12 months of someone pretending to be a pilot. But you look that up on eBay, you can look up specifically uh, a category for aeronautical clothing and then you can pick it uh, according to which airline you want to choose. Mm. Mm. Interesting. But Interesting. Yeah, but the only thing is they're really expensive. Yeah. I yeah. don't know who is buying all these air hostess and pilot costumes. Well, Social engineers, <laughs> apparently. Or couples looking to spice up their sex lives. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Thought it's of that. like, hmm. Well, back off and let the social engineers buy some. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, heck, buy the knockoffs for the other stuff. Well, you don't want them secondhand from a couple that's used them to spice up their love life. <laughs> no, no. You know what's really hard to come by? And believe me, I have tried really hard. UPS uniforms. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? I actually know someone that works for UPS mm -hmm. that could have ready access to one, and basically they tried, and it was damn near impossible for them to get on a uniform. Yeah, they caught on. Well, wasn't it uh, Kevin Mitnick did uh, the attack where he dressed up as the UPS guy? Uh, I don't know if it's the UPS guy. It was a yeah, delivery guy. I'm yeah. not sure if it was, <clears throat> yeah. it was UPS or not. So In the, U in the UK, a data center was done a couple of years ago because uh, some guys dressed up as the police. And this was in London. They went in. They said, there's someone on your roof we need to investigate. Mm -hmm. So the security guys let them in. Because they were dressed as policemen, they had handcuffs. So they handcuffed the security guys to their chairs and walked out with loads of servers. Wow. Um, Did they have billy clubs too? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the security guards are pretty traumatized, but they didn't inflict any injuries on them. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, now that's, that's interesting because you, know, you think about you know, impersonating a law enforcement official. And uh, I saw some study done by one of the, the federal agencies here in the U.S., that published a PDF stating um, there were a bunch of places where you could buy um, fake police badges that were yeah. that were auth almost authentic, and in the same place where the police badges, police departments were getting them from, and you could get them on your own. And then they published the links of all the places where you could get them. Oh wow! And sure enough, you go to the websites, and well, yep, there you go. You can get badges for various cities, counties, you name it. Yeah. But in fairness, you're never, know, you're never going to know if it's a fake badge unless you see a real badge right beside it. Right. You know, I, I don't know off the cuff what a, a proper police badge looks like. I can't picture it right now, you know, I can imagine it. Right, right. It's so, tough. Your duck, that has caused a lot of problems because a lot of officers, what they tend to do is they just put their badge number in their bulletproof vest and they do not show the badge itself. So yeah. here, if you go into any military surplus store, you can get the same uniforms, uh, patches, everything as, as the local cops. Mm. Mm. So there, there have been many, many occasions where drug gangs have even used the uniform and played out as, as if they were cops to get into uh, uh, somebody's house or just uh, even the uh, weapons depot that the police itself uses. Over here in the island recently. 
That's scary. So, Sharon, tell us about yeah. some unsuccessful social engineering attempts, because I think those are great lessons learned. I think there is, but it's actually very hard to be unsuccessful. Because yeah. <laughs> <I think, Yeah. laughs> you could just keep trying, especially if it's a remote uh, attack. The I guess what... what um, stops you from continuing to try is when the receptionist starts recognizing your voice. <laughs> so you might need a bit of a team. If yeah. it's a physical attack again, you can't just keep trying over and over. Uh, but the closest I got to being caught in a physical attack was when uh, they let the security guards know that there would be a social engineering attack happening that week, uh, which I always advise against because if you tell your staff it's happening, right. you don't get a realistic view of whether a a malicious social engineer would be successful or not. Mm -hmm. And and I noticed you said almost got caught. Yeah, yeah. So I went in and um, I used my pretext and they said, that's fine. But before you go into the building, uh, the head of security needs to see you. So I thought, oh, no, I've been caught. So he brings me into a little room, sits me down and starts questioning me. And I said, what's all this about? And he said, well, I'm really sorry to tell you, but this week we have something happening called social engineering tests. I I said, called what? (laughs) So he went on to explain what social engineering was and what would be happening. And I said, I can't believe people do that. (laughs) 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 He said, I know, isn't it terrible? And he brought me all the way through. (laughs) Wow. How did they feel after the fact? Yeah, what did he say after? Did you meet him like after the the gig was up? I'm sorry, we missed that? I don't go there. I don't know. Um, well, to be honest, he called the police afterwards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> after you were well away, right? Yeah, yeah. I was well gone at that stage. And uh, they finally figured out that that was the social engineering attack. So I think they were probably pretty peeved. Yeah. So you never showed your face at that particular facility again? Well, I did. But you see, I'm really bad at uh, recognizing faces. So yeah, I never yeah. know if I ran into that guy again. Right, right, right. Oh. <laughs> Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Now, do you find that if you do uh, social engineering attacks against the same organization, like multiple times, do you have to use different people or do people just not recognize you again or? Uh, It depends on the amount of time between attacks. Mm. So um, if they're not spaced out that far, I will use different members of my team or it depends. I mean. If, you're, if you do one during the day and one at night, it doesn't matter if you go in twice. Mm-hmm. But you don't want to blow your chances. But once I went into a place, I went up to reception and I'd done a, an attack the year before, or a test, I should say, the year before as well. And the receptionist says to me, no way, you're not getting in here. You're the lady from the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> they had all these security awareness posters with me in them. Just been wow. pretty annoyed about it. They didn't Wanted <laughs> for social engineering. <laughs> Oh, that's classic. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so what are, what are some more of the, uh, the more sophisticated um, social engineering attacks where you have to do probably a lot of research beforehand, right? Yeah, I mean, anywhere that's a little more security aware, you're going to have to use a more sophisticated uh, scenario or pretext. Mm-hmm. And I've generally found that's like government or financial organizations. Um, In which case you need to spend, you know, well, 90% of any social engineering attack is reconnaissance anyway. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of time doing your reconnaissance and then you spend a lot of time uh, building up relationships with people you're going to target within the organization. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where uh, a lot of the sophistication comes in because every time you exchange a communication with an individual in the organization, you build up a certain level of trust that you can come back and almost exploit, I guess. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, so do you find yourself often before you physically visit a site, do you, like, interact with people beforehand and, you know, do pretexting, like send them email or call them on the phone to kind of set the stage for your attack when you physically show up on site? Yeah, but I'll also do physical reconnaissance mm-hmm. before I try to physically gain access. So just case the joint see. Uh, where the security guards are, is there CCTV, is there a fire escape, mm-hmm. or even if there, is there a, a car park or a garage underneath the building, because a lot of the time, even though you can't get in the front door because there may be turnstiles or other security mechanisms, you can often just walk into a garage mm-hmm. and tailgate your way in. Right. So it's right. different things like that you look out for. So I do that and I do my uh, 
information gathering online as well or maybe making a few phone calls and then I'll try and get physical access. Gotcha, mm. gotcha. Now, so Sharon, how often in some of the tests do you get to do sort of what they call, refer to as the long con? So you, you really set up uh, uh, an environment and, and that types of things where you're spending months doing uh, a social engineer, months or potentially up to a year. Yeah, that's a lot more rare than I'd like. And I would say a handful of times. Uh, most of the time, I might get a couple of weeks or a month if I'm lucky, sometimes even less. And of course, it depends on the type of attack. Phishing programs are really popular at the moment, so that's a completely different kettle of fish. Right, right, right. Right, yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, because quite honestly, to me, the sort of the long con type of uh, attack is, is, to me, what a determined attacker would do. They're going to spend a lot of uh, resources, especially if you've got something valuable, to to come up with an attack that potentially runs over a year period. I mean, you put someone uh, in a position where they're dating an executive and, and for over a period of time, uh, or you, you business acquaintance and you're coming to the facility often, and then all of a sudden it goes bad. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, th that's a really effective attack. But unfortunately, when it comes to social engineering tests, not many organizations have the budget for a long con like that. <laughs> very, very true. Which, yeah. of, which, of course, the folks that are looking to engage in those types of long cons um, have the budget. Exactly, yeah. So, Sharon, are there uh, physical tools or, or technology that you use uh, in social engineering attacks? Or is it, is it mostly just kind of low-tech stuff? Uh, I have some pretty handy gadgets. I've got a handbag with a secret hidden camera in it, mm. and I've got a pen that records conversations, mm -hmm. which you'd think would be really handy if you sit in an interview with somebody, you just click the pen, it starts recording. Uh, but I chew pens, so when I play oh, no. it, out, <laughs> it sounds pretty gross. <laughs> I can imagine that um, recording. Okay, so listen to this crunch, crunch, crunch. crunch. <laughs> <laughs> so your password is... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that was a bit of a disappointment. But I mean, it's any kind of uh, recording device, any kind of bugging device, and they're so readily available now as well. Mm. I mean, a few years back, you'd have to go to such specialist shops, knock on the door and see if you could get into the shops as your first social engineer even to buy this kind of thing. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. I, I remember, you guys probably do as well, like for, your first fake IDs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't you know what count? you're speaking of. Fake, I fake ID, what's that? What's that? <laughs> I can't believe anybody would have one of those. <laughs> to go out drinking before you're of age. Well, even for my first social engineer or some of my earlier social engineers, they were just laminated, printed at home and laminated, and they were absolutely awful. But now I've got a pretty nifty ID card printer. Mm. So it's little things like that that can just uh, make your social engineering props, I suppose, more effective. Yeah. Mm. But what I'm waiting for is uh, an invisibility cloak. Yeah. <laughs> well, seriously, they're making great advances in the field of invisibility cloaks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Paul, apparently next weekend, if we wear black... Yeah, we'll have invisible. We'll be invisible. <laughs> yes. I was just thinking the same thing. Uh, and several cheesy science fiction movies that I've watched where people are invisible. Yes. Yes. These are not the droids you're looking for. So, Sharon, do you ever get concerned when you're doing a physical social engineering engagement if there are armed gar guards on the property? Oh, yeah. I'll always ask in advance if uh, the guards are armed or if there are dogs either. Yeah. That's quite yeah. common in Europe to have a lot of guard dogs around the place. Really? Huh. Now, do you just pass on those engagements or...? Yeah, or I bring a big juicy steak and throw it the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> I always see that in the movie. Yeah, does that work? Like, I've always seen that in the movies. I've never come across a dog in any of our social engineering, but... I'm never trying it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good call, good call. Yeah, I mean, putting anyone's life at risk, I think, is kind of... Uh, that's where you got to draw the line. Yeah. I passed up one assignment in China because uh, the last person who, well, I think was a thief who tried to get access to the building was shot. Yeah. So I passed that one up, yeah. but I've had nothing else that was too dodgy. Mm. Yeah, and even uh, even at that, the law enforcement in China would just sort of set me off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to go to China and never come back. Yeah. That would be bad. Or Turkey. So how do you convince clients to enable social engineering? I think a lot of the, the folks that I've talked to, you know, when you bring up the topic of physical penetration testing and physical 
uh, social engineering, they get kind of standoffish and they're like, well, I know we'd fail that, so you know, I'm not going to bother. So I guess, you know, how do you convince them? And then kind of a follow on to that is what value after all is said and done do clients get? Yeah, well, it's a tough one. And I've often come up against the same situation where either people say, oh, you definitely get in here. So there is no point in doing it. Yeah. Or people say, oh, you'd never get in here. Right, and they're right. so confident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get in and... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I love that. Then I get in, I go to a different office and I call them up to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it, it's quite a difficult sell, actually. And what I've found uh, over the past year or so, certainly in the past two or three years, it has got very popular. Um, a lot of people have started doing it because of uh, various compliance reasons mm -hmm. or because they really do see it as a threat. I mean, it's, it's hit the news more than ever before and people just don't know what to do about this kind of thing. But uh, lately people have started going for uh, security awareness or social engineering awareness training. I found in conjunction with the testing. So they do the training first so their staff know the kind of thing to look out uh. for. And then they run the tests and that way as well, they don't feel too bad about uh, yeah. social engineering their staff, which is often an issue as well. Right, right. So what kinds of things are you telling the client after all is said and done that, you know, really bring value to their organization? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like any kind of security or penetration test. You find uh, vulnerabilities and you provide recommendations on how to fix them. Mm -hmm. And in the case of social engineering, it could be uh, improvements to their physical security setup. It could be ideas for how to improve awareness amongst staff. Mm -hmm. Or it could even be, you know, if you send uh, some kind of phishing attack with a malicious payload, it could even be some technical improvements that they could make. Mm -hmm. So, so what's the, the recommendation for curing stupid? Oh, well. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> yeah. There is no cure for that, Larry. Yes, there is. It's called a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Very cool. Well, was there anything else you wanted to uh, talk about with respect to social engineering or uh, any conferences you're going to or something like that? Uh, in terms of conferences, I'll be doing a training course at InfoSec in London in April. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one last thing to cover was I was wondering if over there you are getting the calls that go along the lines of, hi, I'm calling from Microsoft Security. Your computer is about to shut down. No, I, I haven't, haven't heard, heard that. that. Yeah. Really? Well, my mom has got two of these calls in the past couple of weeks. They ring her up and they say, Madam, uh, your computer is about to shut down because you don't have the latest security patches installed, which incidentally she does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're looking to get either um, a username and password for the computer or a credit card so that they can uh, maintain the security of her computer. Interesting. Interesting. I'd yeah, so, I'd so I'd, that's a big one. I would really love them to do that to me. I'd love them to call me. Yeah, I love that they call my mom because you know what? They come in from a number. She's called her ID and they come in from a number that starts plus two five. Where's that so my from? mom lives in? That's that's about six African countries start <laughs> plus two five. <laughs> my mom lives in Ireland and she says, uh, where are you calling from? It's the first time she was actually nearly taken with it. She says, where are you calling from? And they said, Dublin. And she said, well, it doesn't look like a Dublin number, and they hung up. Nice. <laughs> so they can't it's even... so easy. Some of these yeah. scams are so easy to make that little bit more effective. You know, it's so frustrating. Yeah, yeah all they have to do is spoof their caller ID. I mean, that's... Or even press private, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'd love for them to call me and say, yeah, we're from Microsoft, and your machine isn't up to date. And I'd love to say to them, I run a Mac. I'm invincible. <laughs> uh, uh, Max don't get viruses. Right, they don't get worms or backdoors or trojans. Those are super secure systems, right? That yeah. Thunderbolt port is awesome. That's yeah. right. That's right. Is that an earthquake? I think so. Thunder? Something like that. It's an earthquake. Oh. I think your son's pushing a chair through the kitchen. He does that a lot. Yeah. He does that a lot. That's fun. Alrighty. Uh, well, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, no like, problem. Like I said, you're welcome to stay on, but I know it's probably late over there. So, uh, thank you for appearing on the show. And no uh, is there a, a blog or a website where uh, you talk about social engineering or? Oh, yeah, you can check uh, my company website. It's firstdefenseis.com. Mm -hmm. And that's first defense in, with the correct spelling it, with a C. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. <laughs> like fence, like a fence.
Yes. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Well, Sharon, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, guys.